Hello and welcome back to the third video lecture on strategic litigation before UN human rights treaty bodies by the International Commission of Jurists. After having looked at what treaty bodies are and the concept of strategic litigation, we'll now examine the different stages in the litigation process so that we can already start thinking of the structure of our complaint. To start with, it is a good practice to have a set of case selection criteria and considerations in place to decide whether we are well placed to take on a specific case and to identify the right forum for the case. This will help ensure that we do not take on cases lightly and develop a plan for the entire litigation process. This will not be much different from your other non-human rights related cases and the criteria can include if you work with an organization or law firm organizational issues such as whether the case falls within the organization's mandate and expertise, whether there is a reputational risk to the organization in taking on the case, but also potential resource implications, as mentioned in video two on strategic litigation. Other considerations will include a potential conflict of interest with already existing cases, as well as client considerations, including the potential impact of the litigation process on the client, risks of reprisals to the client and their family, and, of course, also strategic and impact assessments, such as what legal avenues exist, what steps have already been undertaken by the client, and what strategic values the case could pursue beyond the individual remedy, such as whether the case reflects a specific practice or a systemic problem, for example, the lack of adequate investigations or torture in a specific detention center or by a specific militia or police force. Part of the case considerations will usually include what forum to use to file the case. There might be several options available as the state concern may have ratified multiple treaties and recognized the relevant treaty body's jurisdiction to decide over individual communications. If we look at the example of a sexual violence case committed against a woman in Libya, for example, we could consider filing the case before the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, as Libya has ratified the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, which requires states' parties to rec recognize the competence of the Commission to also consider individual complaints. We could also consider the UN Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, given Libya's ratification of the CEDA Convention and recognition of the committee's competence. And we could file before the UN Human Rights Committee as Libya ratified the ICCPR and its optional protocol, which allows individuals to file complaints before the committee. Which of these three fora to use will depend on our client and strategic considerations as outlined in the previous video lectures. It would be good practice to outline to the client the advantages and potential drawbacks of each forum and to provide guidance as to which one might be the best suited to deal with their case. The procedures for the UN treaty bodies are all relatively similar. For this course, we'll be mainly guided by the UN Human Rights Committee as the committee with the broadest jurisdiction, but the advice is almost equally applicable for the other committees. It will always be important, however, to check the rules of procedure of the committee you eventually end up submitting your case to. So who can file a complaint? Only the victim, or where that is not possible, family members who allege violations under the ICCPR can file a complaint to the UN Human Rights Committee. This means, for example, that you cannot challenge a law or a policy in the abstract without an actual victim. You can also only challenge conditions in detention, for example, if you are doing so on behalf of a victim who is or has been detained in that detention facility. Complainants or victims can be represented legally by a lawyer or non-legally by a human rights organization. It is not necessary to, to be legally represented and victims may choose to file a case themselves though advice from a lawyer or a specialized NGO can help raise the quality of the submission. We'll come back to that when we talk about protection in the next video. However, important to already mention that complaints to the Human Rights Committee cannot remain anonymous. The identity of the victim or their family will be shared by the committees with the state to afford the state an opportunity to respond to the allegations. But 
The victim may request that their identity is not disclosed in the committee's final decision, which are usually public. In such cases, the committee then usually uses an ally. A complaint travels through different stages before the Human Rights Committee. Once it is filed, the committee will consider whether a complaint meets basic admissibility conditions identified in Article 3 of the optional protocol, such as whether it is filed against a state party to the ICCPR and its optional protocol. You remember, you can only file complaints against the state party and only in respect of alleged violations of the ICCPR that were committed after the ratification of the optional protocol unless the violations continued beyond the date of ratification. The complaint must also not be anonymous and be filed within five years after the exhaustion of the final domestic remedy. We'll address these admissibility requirements in further detail in the next video. Where these requirements are met, the committee will give the complaint a communication number under which the case is registered. See also in Rule 92. In my experience, this can take anything from less than five months to up to one year. The committee will inform you about the registration number and you need to refer to this number in all future correspondence with the treaty body or the petitions unit, which is similar to a secretariat that deals exclusively with complaints about human rights violations. If you don't have a case number, you need to follow up with the petitions unit as it means that the case has not been registered in the system. It is important to do this follow up because the petitions unit is under resourced and experiences staff changes and it can happen that they may have missed examining the complaint for registration purposes. The committee may then also ask you to make additional submissions on the remedies requested if you have not made a full request in the initial submission. Once the case is registered, a copy of the submitted complaint is sent to the state party concerned. The committee asks the state party to provide it with any information or observations in respect of the points raised in the complaint, particularly regarding the admissibility and the merits of the complaint. The state has then six months to provide such information and the committee will share the state observations with you so that you can comment on and respond to them. In practice, the state is frequently given an extension and can usually submit such information even after six months. It is not required to comment on the state response, but it is a good opportunity to raise additional points and to challenge the state's versions of events. When you respond to the state party submission, it would be helpful to answer point by point to the arguments raised or otherwise explain why you consider it unnecessary to respond. The state party may then have an opportunity to submit a reply to your response. States, however, often choose not to respond at all, and so the committee will proceed with considering the complaint on the basis of the information before it, that is, the information you submitted in the complaint and potential third-party interveners. Once the committee has sufficient information, it will decide on the admissibility of the complaint before turning to the merits, where it examines whether a violation has actually occurred. Usually, the committee will look at both issues, so at admissibility and merits, at the same time. And so you do not have an opportunity to make additional submissions on the merits after the committee has found the complaint admissible. The committee then issues its views on the complaint, which is basically the committee's decision. A committee's decision sets out its findings on admissibility and the different alleged violations of the covenant. If the committee found violations of the ICCPR, it will also then issue a series of recommendations to the state party concerned regarding the remedies and measures of reparation the state should adopt for the victim but also measures to make sure that the violation is not repeated in the future. So that brings us to the structure of the complaint. How you structure your complaint will depend on whether you use the committee standardized complaint form, in which case there is no flexibility regarding the complaint structure. It is the same form for all eight committees currently accepting individual communications. The form is available on the UN Commissioner for Human Rights website and a link is provided in the notes to this video. However, 
It is not available in Arabic. And the guidance note on the complaint form states expressly that the committees will only accept complaints submitted in one of the working languages of the Secretariat, which are English, French, Spanish and Russian. If you prefer to fill in the form in Arabic, but have no resources to translate the form into one of those languages, you may want to partner with international organizations who may have such resources available. The standardized complaints form was only introduced in 2021 and there is relatively little evidence as to how the committees are using it in practice. It significantly simplifies the complaint as it for example limits the number of words to describe the violations and the remedies requested to 600. As such, it does not provide for a lot of room to set out violations. For now, the use of the complaint form is not obligatory and it is possible to draft your own complaint for as long as you include all required information. The complaint should then not exceed 50 pages. You should start with the provision of basic information about the victim's details and their representative, followed by setting out that this complaint meets the basic requirements under the covenant and the optional protocol and the committee's rules of procedure, as mentioned before. Depending on the complexities of the case, you may want to set out a brief summary of the case at the beginning. This will allow you to already draw the committee's attention to certain issues important to the case and provide a narrative about what happened. Even if you use the complaint form, you may use the section on the facts to set out in one paragraph what the case is about. The summary or introduction should then be followed with the facts of the case in chronological order, answering who was involved in the violations, for example, description and number of prison guards involved in ill treatment, description and number of law enforcement beating up protesters. What happened? This should include a detailed description of the different incidents and may include detailed description of how someone was taken by police, the way they were brought to a place of detention, and if you are alleging that conditions of detention amounted to ill treatment, be very specific in explaining these conditions. When did this happen? Be as precise as possible so that we can establish a chronolo chronology of violations. Where did it happen? Name locations such as prisons or police stations or places where someone was arrested and where they were taken. And then also, why did it happen? For example, is there any indication as to why police arrested, detained and beat someone in detention? Did they use specific words to insult the victim? Did they seek a confession? Did they want to punish the victim for protesting? Things like that. And then, how did the violations occur? Describe the conduct of the authorities. Did they beat up the victim with their fists? Did they use specific tools? And if so, describe the tools. Did the authorities enforce a specific piece of legislation that prevented a protest? The fact section will largely be based upon the victim's testimony and any supporting material such as media articles, NGO reports or findings of a medical legal report where we have it, as we will see in video 6. It might be evident, but it's worth repeating. The section on the facts is crucial, as this will be what the committee bases its decisions on. Be specific, precise and provide as much detail as possible. Do not, for example, in a case alleging torture, simply state that the victim was tortured. Do not make any assumptions that the committees will know about the specific situation or violation that occurred. Provide information about the victim, what happened to them, and do not forget to include crucial information about any remedies the victim may have sought in the country, or reasons why such remedies were not attempted. Explain what impact the violations had on the victim, if possible with reference to the findings in a medical legal report. This can be important to show the seriousness of the violation but also for the remedy request at a later stage. The facts section is often the most challenging to put together. I would not worry about it being too long. This is, after all, the section where the victim has the space to tell their story about what happened. Where you have a lengthy section on the facts, it helps to break it down with subheadings to make it more accessible for the reader. After the facts, 
explain why your complaint meets all the admissibility criteria and we will look at admissibility in video 4. After setting out the admissibility, the complaint should state the different violations of the covenant. As you have already set out in detail the facts of the case, it will now be important to explain how the facts constitute a violation of the covenant under international law. In other words, here you need to apply the law to the facts. The committee members will know the law and be familiar at least with its own jurisprudence. It is not therefore usually necessary to quote extensively from the covenant or from the committee's jurisprudence. It can be sufficient to briefly state the law and then explain how it applies to the facts in the present case. So for example, you may argue that conduct by the police amounted to an arbitrary arrest and detention in violation of Article 9 of the Covenant. First, set out what constitutes arbitrary arrest and detention according to international standards. You can refer to the committee's general comments as well as the committee's jurisprudence, other treaty bodies and courts' jurisprudence, or to decisions and declarations adopted by the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. You would then show how what happened constituted a violation of these standards and how the authorities in question failed to comply with these standards in your case. Following the analysis of the different alleged violations, you should include your request for remedies as discussed with the client and as envisaged in the strategy developed for the case. We'll look at the remedies request in video number 7. In complex cases, and where we think it is necessary for the committee to also receive contextual information about the specific situation in which the violations were committed, we may decide to include a separate section on the context. This can help to flag the systemic nature of a specific violation, such as, for example, widespread use of sexual violence and the state's failure to comply with its obligations to prevent and protect against violations and to repair victims where a violation occurred. This is not always necessary and may only lead to an even longer complaint, but it could be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. This section could come after the introduction and just before the facts, or after the facts and just before the admissibility analysis. Theoretically, you should be able to submit your complaint in one of the UN official languages, including therefore Arabic. However, as mentioned before, the committee's petition unit is chronically under-resourced and has a very limited number of Arabic speakers. It might be for that reason that the committees made clear in 2021 that only communications presented in one of the Secretariat's working languages can be accepted. So you will need to submit in English, French, Spanish or Russian. Where annexes to your case are not in one of these languages, an unofficial translation should be provided. You can send your complaint, once you have finalized it, to the committee by email, together with all annexes in support of your case. Contact details are provided in the notes. How long does it take? As mentioned, the committees and the petitions unit supporting the committee's casework are under-resourced and there is a significant backlog of cases. This also means considerable delays in dealing with a complaint. For example, we have had to wait up to seven years for the committee to decide on a complaint after we had filed it, notwithstanding the gross human rights violations the committee found had been committed, including torture, rape and extrajudicial killing. In other cases, the committee has been quicker and took a decision within four years after filing of the complaint. This brings us to an end of this lecture. Please make sure to check the notes and I look forward to seeing you back for lecture number four, where we look more closely at the admissibility stage.